Welcome everyone. This is our seventh community meeting that we've had for Urban Confluence. We very much appreciate you joining us tonight. There'll be lots of time for Q&A, uh, probably more than 30 minutes. My name is Steve Borkenhagen. I am one of the founders and the executive director of Urban Confluence Silicon Valley. And the protocol for tonight's meeting will be, if you have any comments or questions, please use the chat function. And uh, uh, I, I will call on you to be able to ask your questions uh, aloud. So once we get into Q&A, simply put it into chat. We will monitor your questions and then call on you to ask those questions. This is fine. that's easy. If everyone could please mute yourself, that was good timing right there. Uh, so everyone, please mute yourself, except when you're called on to ask a question, we'd appreciate that. And if you could be as brief as you can, please, when asking questions, we, we'd appreciate it. We very much want to give the design team uh, and our team uh, a chance to answer your questions properly. And also we are recording this, this uh, Zoom call and uh, that recording will end up on our website probably tomorrow. So just know that if you miss something, it'll all be there on the website. So our team is going to do the presentation tonight and it is my pleasure to introduce my partner, Christine Davis. Christine, it's all yours. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for passing the baton and good evening to everybody. I just wanna let you know that those that don't know me that I've lived in downtown San Jose and worked in downtown San Jose for 35 years. And so I'm passionate. You usually hear it in my voice. I'm very passionate about the urban development in downtown and how it will be in harmony with nature. So one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about tonight is why Arena Green? Steve, could you give me the screen? Um, our site, which is Arena Green, Guadalupe River Park uh, Conservancy. <clears throat> originally, we get asked this question quite a bit. And originally we envisioned this project at another site, but at the request of the city leadership, an independent site selection study was a requirement for us to move forward. We had seven downtown sites that were studied and after they were funded and completed by our team, mm -hmm. the site selection study in October of 2018 um, selected Arena Green and it was determined to have the highest score by a large margin. Arena Green then was unanimously approved by the city council on March 12th of 2019. And since then, our team has worked diligently to ensure that this urban core park, one of the jewels of San Jose, and all the city's requirements thus far have been met. <laughs> As people know, I love to say at this point, at the confluence of two rivers lies the world's next iconic landmark. It's my pleasure now to introduce two very crucial partners in our project and ask them to say a few words. First is Nicole Burnham. She's the Deputy Director and Capital Programs for the City of San Jose's uh, Parks and Recreation and Neighborhood Services. And then directly after Nicole speaks to you, um, I want to ask our special guest, which is Jody Starbird, who is the past president of Guadalupe River Park and Conservancy one of the esteemed jurors throughout this whole process, and more importantly, one of our environmental experts. And I've actually named her the chief of police on our project, and you'll know why as she speaks. So please welcome both of them in that order. Nicole? Hi, Christine. Hi, Steve. Um, thank you for inviting me and for letting me um, be here to speak with you tonight. So I was one of the, the city leadership that, that Christine mentioned, who was early on in the project, talked about uh, site selection and, and, and directed this team to, or with the, with the support of council, directed the team toward evaluating in more detail various sites um, where, where an amenity and, and structure like this might be built, which is how we landed at Arena Green. So we've been working with, uh, and I'm 
um, representing, uh, Christine had introduced me, I'm so sorry, I'm a little caught off guard, but uh, Christine had introduced me. Um, I'm the director or deputy director of capital programs for the city's parks department. So anything that gets built in a park usually comes through through my team. Um, so I've been working with that team now since fall of 2017 um, to evaluate sites, consider sites, um, and I continue to work with them to um, to move the project forward in the best way possible in a way that balances the needs of the city, the needs of economic development with the needs of the park system and, and the environment as well. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Um, and I don't know that I'm going to make it through the whole meeting, but I um, but because I, I have another one to go to, but I'm happy to be here and to spend a few minutes and to see the community interest in this project. I, I appreciate it. And with that, I will turn it back to Christine. Christine, you're muted, I believe. And um, is Jody Starbird with us tonight? I have not seen her on there yet. Um, so if Jody is not here, then uh, I would like to move forward. We can always come back to her when she chimes in and introduce John Ball, who is the founder and board chair, uh, one of the founders of the uh, corporation and board chair. So the infamous John Ball, our leader. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Yes, uh, Steve and I and another gentleman, Tom Walnut, came together to form uh, the 501c3 called the San Jose Light Tower Corporation uh, back, uh, seems like just yesterday, but it was back in early 2017 when we, uh, when we had our nonprofit approved by the state and by the federal government. Um, and since then, we've been on quite a journey. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So along the way, um, you know, we, we launched this uh, ideas competition back in July of 2019. And we didn't plan on keeping it open for a year, but we did due to clarification uh, that was required uh, for the presenters. And then of course, COVID hit and uh, we were asked uh, to extend uh, for the benefit of all the presenters so they could have time to react to the pandemic and still get their submissions in. So we ended up extending it out to where it was open for a year. And as most of you know, that have been following the project, we ended up with 963 submissions from 72 countries on six continents. Uh, and many called it the most successful design competition in the world uh, during that period of 19 and 20. We had a jury picked that uh, did the initial downsizing from 963 down to three. And the jury members are here. They're all available to have their bios reviewed by going to the Urban Confluence Silicon Valley website. Uh, there's a easily found drop down tab that talks about the jury. You can click on that and do a deeper dive on each of these jurors, which included me. I'll uh, just mention a few people. I'm in the lower right corner. Uh, John Cicerelli, director of PRNS, is the top center. Jody Starbird, who uh, was mentioned earlier, is in the upper left. And uh, many other notables, uh, including a few that are on the call right now. Uh, so that jury came together uh, last summer in July of 20 and did the downsizing down to three. And, uh, and then we put those three through a rigorous phase two of the competition uh, where they expanded their teams, refined their designs and had from uh, mid-September until January 18th to make their submissions. They got paid a stipend of $150,000 for each of the three teams to help defray the cost that they were going to incur to develop those designs. And then our jury came back together, the exact same jury with absolutely no uh, changes. Uh, the same jury came together to pick the final winner. Next slide, please. Which is the breeze of innovation. Uh, so, uh, and that team is going to do a, a presentation and an introduction of themselves when I get done. But uh, the Breeze was one of those three finalists, and, uh, and you'll hear more about that design and the inspiration behind it in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, our vision includes these following uh, comments. So as Christine uh, mentioned before, and we made it in bold, um, we, we're gonna, we have a long journey ahead of us as a competition. We're embarking on the EIR in conformance with <laughs> California environmental laws, uh, CEQA. And uh, that process starts now and that process is gonna take a year to 15 months or so. Uh, the project will be a gift and it'll be the largest gift in the history of the city of San Jose. And our team is going to orchestrate that gift and raise the funds. Uh, John. Yes. Uh, Jody has joined us. I thought this would be a perfect segue since you were just talking about CEQA to welcome her and let her speak. Great. So Jody, thanks for joining. We skipped over you when you weren't there. Uh, uh, can you just introduce yourself and uh, how you see your role in the project, much like you did last time? Thanks, John and Steve and Christine. I'm sorry I was a little bit late. Things have been a little bit hectic lately. Um, but I am Jody Starbird. I'm the past president of the board of the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. Uh, we are the city's nonprofit partner in the activation and development of the Guadalupe River Park for all of the residents of downtown and San Jose and the region, um, working a lot with different communities, trying to bring, bring communities together to create a fabulous downtown ribbon of green, as I like to call it, um, that runs along the Guadalupe River. Um, and we have been involved in this process since almost, well, maybe not quite its inception, but pretty close. Um, just sort of following along, offering advice, um, you know, helping get it through some of the, the processes that it needed to get through. But we are the environmental organization that is watching the process every step of the way. I also happen to be an environmental consultant. I write environmental impact reports. I'm not writing the impact, environmental impact report for this project. But um, I have 35 years of experience working for the city of San Jose on different projects, whether they be public or private. And so I've sort of helped guide the, the process in terms of the California Environmental Quality Act, as John mentioned, CEQA. So we've been watching every step of the way. We're going to continue in that role as the, the project moves forward. And, you know, we're all about being stewards of this ecosystem. And that's what we pride ourselves on. And all the flora and fauna and everything that's happening in just not the Guadalupe River, but also Los Gatos Creek, um, to be sure that they are sensitively, um, you know, respected. That's something that's very important to us, uh, while also bringing activation and bringing the community to the river park. So those are sort of our main uh, goals, and we will continue in that vein throughout this process. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate that. That is a good segue. And I will say that we're 100% in sync with everything we've learned from Jody and uh, also from Nicole, and uh, feel like we have a great team and we couldn't be successful without their support and input. Uh, so. Thank you, Jody, again. Um, in this uh, fifth bullet on here, the project will not impact spending on public services. Uh, and we, we firmly believe, and it's been proven by uh, many of the donors and institutions that we've talked to, uh, although it's been raised as a concern that maybe the money we're raising is gonna take money out of the social services programs that help feed the hungry and house the homeless. And it's just not uh, true. Um, that that money is still going to be there. And there are people that look to put their money into capital projects rather than social services. And there are people that want their money put to social services and not capital programs. So, uh, and then of course, there's people that, <laughs> that do both. So, uh, and, and uh, so the money is not coming out of the general fund. It's, it's being raised privately uh, through the efforts of our organization. 
And uh, finally, we, we just, uh, I think we've all seen some of our local parks deteriorate uh, even before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic. And our goal here is to have our uh, jewel of Arena Green at Guadalupe River Park and Gardens come out of this much improved uh, with a maintenance plan that we help fund, that we do fund and we orchestrate so it won't be a burden on the backs of the taxpayers of San Jose. So thank you. Uh, next slide, Steve. These are the, some of the things that we're gonna cover in phase three. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. I mentioned the, uh, uh, obviously the environmental, but the design will continue. We're gonna address all these things. There are certain details that uh, need to be refined as we go through the design process. And you know what happens with the carousel, what happens with the playground, all of these things will be addressed. So whatever questions come up tonight, we're working on it, but we don't have those answers, but they will obviously be addressed as we move uh, through phase three. Uh, the, this is a uh, illustration that shows the future. We're only uh, here at phase two, at the conclusion of phase two. And we have this major event coming up, which is another one of these interim check-ins with city council. We've had two previous ones to date, both of which were unanimously approved, including the one in March of 2019 that Christine mentioned that was the approval of the site. And then, uh, so after May 4th, we roll into phase three and beyond. And uh, there's a lot of TBDs on there uh, because uh, we have a lot of work to do to uh, go from phase to phase. And our goal is to have this project completed in 2025. Next slide. So with that, I wanna turn it over to uh, Fair. And why don't you introduce yourself, Fair, and uh, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, tonight to present um, Bridge of Innovation. So my name is Fer Jerez. I'm the director and founder of Smart Architecture Studio, um, which uh, is a firm that was selected as a finalist last year um, to, the, to design uh, this amazing icon and then um, put together an amazing team, uh, which uh, includes MBH as an architectural record and Magnus and Clemenschik as a, a structure engineers, HOK and other uh, great firms uh, in America to develop this project. Um, so we are um, a young but experienced uh, firm with more than 10 years uh, doing projects around the world. We have done uh, quite a few projects, uh, uh, large scale projects, museums and library, uh, libraries in three continents. Um, but I have to say that this project uh, in, in, in San Jose uh, and Silicon Valley is the most exciting project um, we, we have ever face uh, because of all the elements uh, that that includes the place, uh, the, the the innovation that we put in this project, uh, and the and the expectations we have when when it's completed. Um, next, please. Next, please. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to uh, show you briefly a couple of projects that we're working uh, right now. Uh, we believe, uh, um, I'm going to show you this project, is a, this is a, the, the main library in, in Sandown in South Korea, and I'm going to show you another project that we are currently building in the north of Europe. Uh, yes, uh, so um, the, 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 the reason I'm showing this project is because uh, both projects are uh, in public parks, and uh, this, uh, in, in, in our um, philosophy as an office, uh, we always uh, try to, besides uh, designing a compelling building, a, com a compelling landmark, uh, or what is uh, asked by the organizers, we, we always try to uh, some, to create to create a place. Um, so, uh, as I said, this two, this the, this project that you're seeing is a public library, it's a ten thousand square meter public library, which which is which creates a, a, a continuity with the park and creates an outdoor and indoor spaces. Uh, for people to uh, to enjoy, so it's creating a place. Our objective. Next, please. And this this one that is currently being built is a fifteen thousand square meter uh, museum in, in in another park in another Europe. 
um, as a science museum, <clears throat> and the and, and and the goal again was to to create an iconic building that was visible from the from the old from the old town and from the city, uh, but also um, a design that was able to react to reactivate the park and create a place for people to enjoy. So we have a, a roof where people can go by. The park merges with the building and the context. Next, please. Air, may I interrupt you for a moment? Uh, can I'll, everyone please mute? There's somebody has a background noise, so please mute. I'm sorry, Fair. Please continue. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, thank you. So the, this this project is in a park and also has a river, uh, so it's a, it's a very close to the water, um, and it's and it, and it has a very very similar conditions that the project we have designed um, in 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 Silicon Valley. Uh, next, please. So the, the the challenge in this project was uh, was 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 great. We've been working uh, uh, really hard in the last year, uh, first to to come up with the idea, to come up with a concept that was able to uh, crystallize uh, three elements: innovation, how to uh, rep represent innovation in the twenty first century with all the challenges that we have ahead. Uh, then a connection with the community. How can we engage with the memory of San Jose in a, in a deep way? And then uh, the park, how can we merge uh, with the park? How can we activate the park, but at the same time, uh, create a project that is that belongs, that try to belongs as much as possible uh, to it. So um, the, the elements that we, that, that we work with was, were energy, wind, and nature. And as you can see in these images, uh, is a, the, the, the structure is, is kind of a, uh, through, it's a collection of, of vertical elements, of connection of vertical tubes, flexible tubes that are able to uh, be bent and take advantage of the energy of the breeze, of the energy of the wind to create light. Uh, so to, in, in order to achieve a, a zero carbon footprint, uh, but also uh, be able to activate uh, the place around uh, with a outdoor coffee, and uh, and also bring the memory of San Jose uh, through, uh, as you probably uh, been able to see, um, um, uh, kind of a rebirth of the old electric light tower, San Jose. Next, please. So as you can see, one of the the, main, the important uh, elements of the project uh, of the project is lighting, but not artificial lighting. Not only artificial lighting is natural light. Uh, so because of the qualities of the materiality and the and, and the and the design. Uh, the project is able to uh, be almost transparent or reflect the different times of the day. And during the night, uh, we, we've been working and we are working and we're going to be working with uh, lighting experts, environmental lighting ex experts to, to, to try to get the right type of lighting that is able to be uh, consistent and respectful of the environment and the ecosystem of the park. Uh, and at the same time, in particular moments, create these moments of light in particular days or in particular events. Uh, but uh, as I said, work with the natural light uh, most of the time. But one of the most important things in, in, in this uh, uh, iconic structures is experience. So as you can see in the top uh, left image, uh, we, we wanted to create this, this space with this, uh, which is a tribute to the old electric light tower. It has the exact same dimensions of the old electric light tower of San Jose. So you can, you can, you can see the silhouette of the electric light tower uh, during the day and the night. And then, uh, as you can see in the bottom left uh, image, uh, the separation of the vertical elements uh, allows all kinds of kids and, 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 and it's, a, it's a kind of a playground in the park. Is a, an artificial forest has tried to merge with the natural forest. And, and uh, next, please. And also uh, allows you to go up in the structure and create uh, this experience uh, that allows you to uh, see the valley from another perspective. And I, I would like to, 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 to say here that um, sometimes we think that uh, not doing anything uh, would be the best option, and, and sometimes might be, but some, but, but, but a lot of times, uh, architecture contributes to offer new perspectives and new um, understanding of the place. And, and we have the, uh, for example, I, I can put the example of the mm, High Line in New York, where this elevated park uh, over a railway has bring 
a totally new experience of how to contemplate a city uh, like New York and Hudson River and so on and so on. So this is something uh, that we try uh, to do here, how in, in, in create this kind of journey going up a structure and being able to see San Jose from another perspective until you get, next please, to the top and, and at night uh, you can see this landscape of, um, of light that is on is activated when when it when it's windy and during the day you can see the reflection of the natural light hitting hitting up the the tip of the rods and we really believe that this could be a unique experience that could be an amazing experience for the community of san jose and for the people uh around the america or the or the world that is able to visit uh thank you and now i give the um um, I present Eddie Hall from MBH Architects. Thanks, Fer. <clears throat> um, as Fer mentioned, my name is Eddie Hall. I'm with MBH Architects. We're a Bay Area firm. And our role on the project will be as the executive architect. Um, just to clarify what that, what that means, um, generally, we, we will be working with SMAR um, throughout the process to make sure that we're realizing their design, and staying on track with that, um, upholding life safety and code compliance for the building. And then of course, coordinating the many consultants and partners. Um, it takes a village to build something like this. And we're, we're thrilled to be partnered with um, such a talented design team and um, consultant team. So, just a little bit about MBH. Um, I've been with the firm for 11 years, but we, we opened in 1989, about, 20, about 32 years ago. And we are 160 strong. However, 120 of those folks live in the Bay Area and are members of all the Bay Area communities, including San Jose. So we are quite literally your neighbors and community members. And as such, we have a, a vested personal interest in making sure that the project is a success and contributes to the community and makes it a, um, a, a more vibrant and a better place to live. Um, we do quite, quite a bunch of different work um, from retail to restaurants, workplace and labs, as well as uh, multifamily housing and some other types. Um, but you know, needless to say, this, this project stands out. This is a very unique, uh, one of a kind, um, unprecedented project. And we're, we're thrilled to be part of this. If we can go to the next slide. I put together a few um, projects around the Bay Area just to kind of showcase um, for you. Um, MBH has done work in San Jose in the past. Um, generally multifamily housing, as well as some historic rehab um, and other projects in the Bay Area that we currently have on the boards include Pier 70, which is a large multi-phase multifamily uh, development. Uh, 1966 Ninth Street um, was an adaptive reuse project that includes housing and a restaurant function. And MBC Biolabs uh, we recently completed phase one of that project and they've gone on to um, participate in COVID research and development, which is um, really rewarding. One of the, the best parts of my job are when we get to work on projects that leave communities and, and leave the world a better place than when we started. That's, that's what it's all about for me. Next slide, please. Um, just a few others. This is my last slide. Um, 300 grant is a uh, MBH in-house design. That's a six-story office and retail building in downtown San Francisco. Um, that recently completed and um, we were in the SF Chronicle as um, the top 10 best projects that were completed during COVID. Uh, that just came out last week, so that was exciting. 200 Brannon, as well as Rincon Green, which is in the upper right, are also MDH uh, design multifamily projects in San Francisco. Um, in the center of the slide is the Uptown Station, which is a project that has been near and dear to me 
uh, as I've been working on it for the last four and a half years, we just completed. That was the renovation of the 1929 HC Capwell building in downtown Oakland. And we renovated that building, we included a 95 foot atrium, seismically retrofitted it, um, included six stories of office, an underground parking garage, and some retail function at the ground floor. And then finally, the Bacar Bioingenuity Hub um, is a um, renovation of the historic Berkeley Art Museum uh, near UC Berkeley campus. And that was designed by Mario Ciampi um, in a design competition actually, um, and was completed in 1970. We are um, expanding that again, seismically retrofitting and um, adapting that over to become a uh, life science hub center. So um, all this to say that, you know, MBH has experience with complicated, large projects, with very large teams. Um, however, all of these projects pale in comparison to the breeze of innovation. And we're thrilled to be part of the team and really look forward to it. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Ron Klemensik. Great, hey, thank you, Eddie. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Ron Klemensik uh, with Magnuson Klemensik Structural Engineers. Uh, super, super excited to be part of this project. Uh, it's not often that uh, an architect or a client calls up and asks, uh, I want to design this building and I want it to intentionally move. Most of the structural engineering we do intentionally stays in place and doesn't move much. So very excited to be involved. Uh, over the last 101 years, our company's been involved in some of the most amazing projects all around the world. And in fact, several of them, many of them, in fact, are international design competition. And I have to offer my hearty congratulations, parent, very professional um, competition. Uh, we all had a great time uh, being part of it. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> part of our projects not only are iconic, but many of them are uh, placemaking projects that are identified as uh, uh, items or uh, iconic pieces that you'd recognize the place with. And so it's quite fun to be a part of not only unique structures, but structures that actually signify a place. Next. Slide, please. Mike, could I have the next slide, please? There we go. So, Ron, I'm not Ron. This is Steve. I'm not sure if you can hear me. You are you are freezing and uh, more recently in. Sorry, I have a, uh, a supposedly unstable connection. I apologize for that. Can you hear me all right now? We can now, but Ron, you were freezing a moment ago. All right. Well, we'll uh, quickly get through this. So some of these uh, iconic projects like the Seattle Library uh, was built on a very tight budget with public money on public land. Uh, and became a very uh, uh, important icon for Seattle. Next slide, please. Yeah, we're going go the other way, please. Mike, can you advance there? Thank you. One more. Uh, like the Lincoln Park Pavilion in Chicago, which has turned out to be one of the most photographed uh, uh, new structures in Chicago built in a public park uh, with private funds, but it's an amazing and beautiful structure. Next slide, please. A little bit closer to home in the Bay Area, uh, we've been involved in many, many projects around uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Most recently, the Chase Center. Next slide, please. <laughs> uh, 
for the Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. For the final slide, please, Mike. The San Jose Airport, of course, uh, is a major project of ours. But in addition, in downtown San, Fran uh, San Jose, a number of the high-rise office towers, the uh, PayPal Park, which is the home of the Seattle Earth or the San Jose Earthquake soccer team, uh, was one of our designs, and currently under construction uh, with the J. Paul Company 200 Park Avenue. So we're heavily invested in the San Jose community uh, and really look forward to participating in this project and making it a reality. Thank you. Steve, back to you. Thank, thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> we'll go now into Q&A. Uh, John Ball, do you want to begin that process? Yeah, I've been uh, trying to answer a few of the chats. Uh, I, I want to go back uh, up to near the beginning where Art Weisbrot asked uh, a question <clears throat> I want to get to. Uh, I answered Doris's uh, question uh, that had to do with lighting. And I answered that to all. So I consider that one answered. She said she had to drop off at 630. But I did answer that in the chat. And um, so Art Weisbrot said, do we know whether there will be bike paths? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and the intent and uh, Nicole uh, could supplement this if Nicole is still here, I'm looking for her. But uh, there will be bike paths along the Guadalupe River that are part of the Google project and, uh, and also beyond Arena Green to the north, which already exists. So the intent is to continue and improve the connectivity of the bike paths. Jody, do you have anything you wanna to add to that or is that uh, accurate enough? You're muted. Um, yeah, I, the only thing I would add is that there are existing bike paths that are heavily traveled on both sides of the Guadalupe River and used by commuters every single day. We've done trail counts over the years, and it's, it's a vital transportation corridor for bikers, and that will be maintained uh, with or without this project. Yeah, thank you. And then Art also asked about walking and hiking paths. Uh, yes, there will be sidewalks and walking paths that actually work along with these bike paths. Uh, police and security, 24 hours a day, Art was your question. Let's just suffice it to say that there will be uh, security as part of this project. And at night when it is not open, it will be locked and secured. It will have a uh, suitable fence um, I would say, if anything, uh, for those of you that are local that know the Rotary Play Garden fence and the fact that that project has, uh, knock on wood, been safe from taggers and safe from vandals, um, part of it's because it's locked up at night and it's got a pretty good perimeter non-climbing fence that I had something to do with. Uh, so that is the same kind of vision that we have for this project. It will not be accessible uh, at night when it's after hours. And then Art, uh, do you want to jump in and see if I you have anything else? Uh, or is that ample to answer your questions? You asked about food stands. Sorry, you asked about food stands. And uh, it is anticipated that we will have food and beverage. Uh, and those are some of the details that will be worked out in the future phases. Art, thumbs up. Is that is that good? Uh, no, it's fine. Thank you, John. I, I was envisioning maybe stands where they sold things besides food, you know, like a fair that could be open uh, to the public uh, where you could buy different things and also buy food and sit down and have a picnic if you wanted to have a picnic. But I, I think this is probably down the road and you're not probably ready to address it. 
it is down the road and these are all things that we've talked about but now that we have a winning design team uh we can catalyze uh, or crystallize uh, these thoughts into design as we move forward. And of course, for everybody, this is not the last community meeting. As uh, uh, Steve will say at the end, there will be future uh, community engagement as we go through the future phases. That takes care of my question. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. There was a question about uh, art and I uh, <laughs> appreciated the answer that art is in the eye of the beholder. And yes, we I will say that during phase one and phase two of this competition, uh, you know, we didn't know whether an artist was going to win this design because the submissions, by the way, were blind. In other words, we, the jury, did not know who the submitter was. And uh, that was by uh, that was a deliberate so that uh, there could be no uh, influence either consciously or subconsciously that if somebody knew somebody was either local or international there wouldn't be any bias there on the part of a jury member and if they happen to know uh, somebody by reputation we didn't want that person to have an advantage over someone that was an unknown so when all when phase one was uh, we went through and we picked the final three. Uh, we did not know uh, where, who they were or where they came from. In fact, all three, like Fernando, were international and not US born. Although two young gentlemen that were on the other two teams were uh, US educated at Harvard and in Southern California. Um, so it was kind of fun to see who came out of it, but we didn't know whether, whether they would be an architect or an artist or a structural engineer or a lay person. Uh, the phase one submission requirements were wide open. So you can call it art, uh, but I will say that the winner of this competition, Fernando, is an architect. And this is uh, taking the form of a structure that's designed by an architect with a world-class team around them, including Ron Klemensik, who is a world-class structural engineer I'll put those words to him because he probably wouldn't. And HOK, who has uh, several disciplines that are part of this team, are a world-known architectural firm, as is MBH. So we have a team that's going to address all these challenges as we move forward. John, I'd like to suggest that we let uh, Martin Flores has a couple questions. Martin, would you like to uh, unmute and ask some questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very interested, and this is, a you know, living in San Jose for most of my life and uh, having an input on the, the Arena Green project. Uh, I'm very interested as the project touches the ground, how it's going to really interface with the surrounding areas. And to date, I've seen some images of, of some um, um, things that aren't really... Uh, correct in terms of how it hits the ground and these green acres of lawn that is not really uh, part of this. And so I, I'd be interested to understand and, and have a little more feeling about uh, from the landscape architects of how this project really starts to integrate with the park as it exists today, because that was a in, integral, it took years of years of thought process to get that going and engagement with the different agencies, as well as the potential of another bridge going over the river. And I know having experience putting the first bridge over, it was incredibly difficult to put one bridge over the river. So again, these are aspects, again, we're, we're down the line. I, I, I get that, but um, I, I think it's important to really understand the impacts and, and the realities of start understanding of the impacts of when this hits the ground and what types of um, projects or what types of issues are gonna be addressed as we move forward. So that's, that's, my, that's my comments. Thank you, Martin. John, would you like to comment and then let's let Fair comment on it also? Yeah, I was thinking I'd start and then let him finish. So 
Um, the, currently, the, the project is uh, uh, anticipated to be located in the northern portion of Arena Green West, outside of the riparian corridor, 100 foot setback line uh, from Tapa Bank, and between that line and Autumn, and generally where the north edge of SAP Arena intersects Arena Green West. So it's in that, uh, it's anticipated to be there. Um, there is an architect, as I mentioned, Martin, I think I was checking this out earlier, but uh, there is a landscape architect, HOK Architects on, on the team that is not uh, presenting tonight. And uh, we will be working on those details as we move forward, because we have to do scoping to figure out what all is gonna be included in our EIR application. And so uh, these are all great questions. And those are things that we're working on that we don't have answers to. Um, but uh, with the input of uh, GRPC and Jody's team, as well as input, uh, clear input from PRNS, because they are the city owners of the park on behalf of the taxpayers, we have uh, all that is going to be done in a, a coordinated effort. Uh, Fair, you want to amplify on that, please? Yeah, thank you, John. I just wanted uh, to say that um, the, the project is designed to have uh, the minimum impact in the part. That's the reason, instead of being a solid uh, structure or something that requires a heavy um, um, structure for implementation, is a lightweight uh, collection of, of rods with a separation of about uh, five feet between them, which allows people to walk freely in between uh, among them. So it's a so you can think of the part of the project as a forest. We've been working closely with the landscape architects. We have that experience in other projects that we've done uh, in other parks. But in this particular case, as John has said, we are uh, in the in the areas that uh, um, are inside the construction boundaries, uh, close but but sufficiently uh, separated from the riparian corridor not to interfere uh, with the ecosystems. But, uh, but and, and, and also is the, the footprint is designed to impact the minimum amount of trees and, the, and, and the minimum trees that we are going to impact they are going to be replanted in the park itself. So that's part of the, the use of the current uses of the park uh, are going to be um, integrated. So that is not uh, that, that at the same time we are Kind of in, in improving or uh, enhancing uh, uh, the, the 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 activation of the park, we are we're trying to keep uh, the activities that currently happen in the park, uh, as, as in the lawn uh, and so on. And then, as I said, when you look at the structure, because of it's a collection of vertical elements uh, that are separated and has air in between them, you will see a almost a semi-transparent structure. Uh, from all kinds of view, you, you won't see a, a solid element in uh, on the part. You will see something that is, is that is almost like a, an artificial forest, and that's the idea. Uh, that uh, that uh, the, this merging of nature and architecture, and it's also part of the design because uh, the fact that it, that the project is always is is um, able to to move slightly with the wind and and uh, is is kind of uh, replicating the experience of a tree. So the image that we had when we were designing was the, the image of, of a tree where you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of lightweight um, structure that, that moves slightly and creates this kind of sense of, uh, of, of uh, pleasure around. Thank you, Fair. Dave Pochelle, would you like to ask a question? Uh, sure. Well, I, I have a little concern about uh, the fiberglass structure if it will be uh, you know, a maintenance concern. I know uh, to protect against UV lighting, they need to have like a gel coat. Uh, fiberglass also, it's, it's a lightweight, you know, it's a good structure uh, for building th you know, certain things, but it, I, I, my understanding is it's a little bit uh, subject to uh, fatigue uh, with movement, you know, with flexing. Um, I'm wondering if you're, uh, your structural engineer has experience with uh, fiberglass. I also have some concern about the airport. You know, this is uh, near um, the airport as planes are landing and being 200 foot tall at that point, the, air, 
the airliners are, are landing at, at about like 350 feet. And if you've gotten support from the, air com, uh, the airport commission. So I wanna, uh, before I turn it over to Ron Clemensic, uh, just clarifying for you, David, that the, uh, the rods are not made out of fiberglass, they're made out of stainless steel. Uh, so Ron, can you talk about your work on fatigue and your future uh, wind tunnel testing that you plan on doing and then turn it back over to me and I'll address the airport question. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, John. And I do apologize for my connection here. Uh, I'm actually on holiday and uh, my internet is not working very well. Um, Ron, can you uh, maybe turn your video off and that might help on the audio? Did you hear my question? Did you hear yep. uh, David's question? Got it. Okay. Yes. Uh, about the uh, fatigue? Yes, and the fact that the rods are made out of stainless steel and what the rest of the structure is made out of. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, and again, apologies for the connection. So during the uh, study phases of this project early on, we investigated a number of different material choices uh, settling on stainless steel in the end, uh, because it does have uh, great properties as it relates to durability, as it relates to UV protection, and as it relates to fatigue. Uh, part of the design will include a really extensive uh, set of wind tunnel tests where we look at all these questions in much greater detail. And in keeping the stress levels down to very low levels on the rods will allow the fatigue life to be very substantial. We're currently shooting for a 100 year life or beyond uh, as a minimum for the, for the rods. So um, I'll turn it back to you then, I think. Okay, very John. good. If I could just, just real quick follow up. So that, that means that it, I, I, I presumed it was kind of glowing from inside. So the lighting will be reflected off of the steel. Is that it? Or how is the lighting gonna? you know, be conducted with the steel. And I'm gonna leave that for uh, Fair, I believe. Yeah, Fair, can you take that one? Yeah, the lighting um, is gonna be, so this is different, we've been working with the lighting consultants um, with, a, with a number of options and, and the lighting um, is designed, so the, there's different layers of lighting. Uh, the most spectacular one we believe is the tip of the rods, which is the, uh, it's a it's a kind of signal lighting that only activates when the when when there is wind, so it has this kind of environment uh, kind of uh, statement about uh, clean energy that we think is very important now in current you know in the times of climate change and global warming that uh, a message to communicate that that with no um, fossil fuels uh, with no electricity grid you can create light. So this kind of magic, uh, this is this is one of the main elements of the of the project. the the other The other lighting uh, is is going to be projected in such a way that uh, will create like an atmospheric light uh, in the building. First to uh, light up the void uh, of the so as you, so the structure is as I said a collection a forest of uh, vertical rods, and in the middle you have a void which will be used for uh, local artists for to do exhibitions and the, the void has the same the same dimensions of the old electric light tower uh, of the 8081 that was built in San Jose and it will have a spotlights on top uh, so in in, in, in 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 moments in some special days you will see the silhouette of the old electric light tower light up that's another lighting effect and the third lighting effect uh, Will be an atmospheric light uh, uh, with a series of uh, lighting projectors that will be hidden uh, below the pathways, the ramps. So we have a, a journey, uh, a series of pathways that allows you to go to the top and, and meanwhile enjoy the views of the valley. And below there we have uh, a series of uh, uh, spotlights that, that are able to uh, create uh, mixing up the lights, this kind of atmospheric uh, light uh, in the project, and and we we've been working on how to to create these special effects of light, uh, respectful of the uh, ecosystem, uh, with a series of wavelengths and temperatures of light uh, that doesn't affect birds or uh, the, the the local fauna. 
and I create this kind of atmospheric uh, light effect when it's necessary. Okay, thanks, Bear. Um, Dave Poshel, I did answer your question about uh, the airport and OEI in chat. I want to be efficient with our time because other people may have questions and uh, I'm hoping that answers your question, but we have been uh, all over the height limits. Uh, we are in compliance with the OEI and we will stay in compliance with OEI and we will stay in compliance with lighting restrictions that are related to the airport because we need to have at the end of the day a declaration of negative effect on the FAA um, as part of getting this project approved. So <laughs> we're not going to be irresponsible about either the environment or the operations at SJC Mineta. Um, to do otherwise would be unacceptable on our part. We'd never get the project approved. Uh, Ann Chung, would you like to ask your question? And I'm thinking that if, if Jody Starbird, oh, Jody is still here, that J Jody might want to comment on that. Ann, are you still there? Yeah, my question was just about the height um, because of the airplanes and the birds, but uh, I guess it kind of already got answered. Jody, would you like to weigh in on that at all, or do you feel like it's been adequately discussed? I feel like it's been adequately discussed. Anne also had a question about the connectivity of the uh, river trails um, and lack thereof. And boy, I couldn't agree more with her. Um, the connectivity of the river trails does need to be improved. And we've been working with the city for a number of years to you know, work on that. We always have to remember that we're within a riparian corridor. So to create new trails right along the river is, is pretty diff difficult from a regulatory standpoint. But boy, I do agree that there are improvements that could be made to, you know, stop some of the dead ends and improve the connectivity like on Park Avenue. There's, there's improvements to be made. I couldn't agree more. And I will point out <clears throat> as far as process is concerned, we are working with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Conservancy, with the Parks Department to really just make the park better in, in, in terms of the overall activation and the various elements. Uh, so uh, I know Jody and Nicole would say that we've, been, we've all been working diligently on that and we will ratchet that up in the, in the coming months. Um, Julian Lecompte uh, uh, had a couple of questions, particularly about light pollution. Julian, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Hi. Um, I am concerned about uh, the light pollution that would be generated by this project. So I looked at the images on uh, the project page and I think they're extremely misleading. Uh, for example, it shows the light structure in front of a starry sky. I don't know when was the last time you looked at the night sky from anywhere within the confines of our city, but it's not like that. It's milky gray. The amount of light pollution in our city is already really bad. We're not quite as bad as LA or Dallas, but we're really bad. And I'm afraid this project is going to make it worse. Now, I'd like to know how we're going to mitigate it. The city dims the lights after or most uh, street lights after a certain time at night. I'd like to know what your plan is here. I hear that you keep referring to we're working with environmental lighting expert. I'd like to know who these people are. I was involved 10 years ago with the rollout of LED lights and we were being told lies at the time. I mean, we already believed, we believed it then, turns out it was, there were lies. And these were consultants who actually made a lot of money from this project. So I'd like to get some exact answers about how you're going to mitigate that pollution. Is all the lights going to be turned off after a certain time? Are they going to be dimmed? Um, please give us some answers. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, it's 6.59 p.m. So I'm going to give something very brief and then I'll, I'll let John or others do that if they like. But um, the Brian Order from Bold Design uh, did a lighting study. We will have more lighting studies. Um, we had H.T. Uh, Harvey do a biology study, which also involves lighting. So what I'll tell you, uh, Julian, is that we are studying these issues. We will continue to do so for will fair will have people on his team doing those studies and i want to just remind everyone as we get near closing that 
every question we got tonight will be answered in writing on our website. So please know that, that that's the case. And also, if you don't feel like you're getting a satisfactory answer, please pick up the phone and call me or you can email me. My information is through, throughout our website. So uh, John or Christine, would you like to make final comments before we sign off? Yeah, I just want to address uh, Julianne. I appreciate your questions. I uh, trust that no matter what we said tonight, I probably wasn't going to adequately answer your question to your satisfaction, but I would like you to think about it on these terms, uh, Julian and others that have questions about lighting. And that is, is that we have a very conceptual design and you're asking a very detailed question that we will get to as we go through the design process. But you know, if you're familiar with schematic design, design development, construction documents, and construction administration, we're not even at half schematic design level right now. So to ask specific questions about lighting levels and mitigation, we're gonna get to it, believe me, we're gonna get to it, but we're not there yet. So we can't answer that with specificity tonight, uh, but you have our assurances that um, uh, in order to uh, get through the CEQA process and make sure we're not having negative uh, effect on fish, birds, and other mammals uh, and, and wildlife in general, as well as light pollution. And uh, we know Mount Hamilton is there. There's a lot of sensitivity about light uh, pollution in the night sky. We will have uh, a schedule for when this thing goes dark. We will abide by uh, migratory patterns and when it's sensitive so that we don't throw uh, the birds off on their migratory patterns we're going to go dark uh, for days or a couple of weeks at a time, depending on what the science tells us. We will comply with that. So with that, um, I think we're gonna wrap it up uh, and uh, we promise to answer everything that didn't get answered and it'll be on our website, the Urban Confluence Silicon Valley website. And there's a easily found drop down tab that talks about community meetings and all the Q and A. Christine, would you like to say anything before we wrap up? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, I get a, everybody needs to leave with a chuckle, right? But uh, they really make us better. And community outreach has always been extremely important to us. And we don't live in a bubble. We're reaching out to everyone. And this is a transformational project for this great city and great cities do great things. And part of the reason that Breeze of Innovation was selected by the jury is it's a challenge. And that's what represents the spirit of innovation in Silicon Valley is the challenge is to do something that's not been done and do it successfully. And so we just want all of you to have the confidence that everyone's input here really matters in the overall for the, for the design team, for the construction team, for us, for fundraising and everything to build it and to maintain it. And so I just wanna conclude by saying, thank you. One other thing is someone asked earlier about how do you feel or what do you wanna feel or see when you, when you see Breeze of Innovation? And it really symbolizes in, in our hearts that it is people standing together and working together. And I think that's a very powerful statement for Silicon Valley around the world. Uh, thank you, Christine. And I also wanna thank everyone for attending, but I do have one important point that I'd like you to all take away, particularly people who are concerned about environmental degradation, light pollution, flora and fauna. And that is that we are go going to go through a full EIR CEQA process as John Ball mentioned earlier, and as uh, Jody Starbird also uh, alluded to. Uh, we are not going to do anything that's illegal or against rules. We couldn't if we wanted to, and we don't want to. So I just wanted to reassure all of you that that's the case. Uh, many people have stated otherwise, but it's simply not true. So please con continue to give us uh, constructive criticism and advice. And we're trying to make this a, a fabulous project for our city and a beautiful place for us to go with our children, grandchildren, and their children and grandchildren. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Feel free to contact me anytime. So good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.